Hi, my name is Rod Hamilton, and I'm the Associate Registrar at the College of Physiotherapists of Ontario. In this presentation, I'm going to cover information to help you better understand the Regulated Health Professions Act, often referred to as the RHPA. This video may be of specific interest to council members, non-council committee members, regulatory staff, and other stakeholders who may be affected by the RHPA or involved with health professions. I have two goals. The first is to introduce you to some key ideas that underpin the regulation of Ontario health professionals, and the second is to provide an overview of the current health professional legislation in Ontario. To properly understand these concepts and the legislation itself, we need to provide some background. I'll start by exploring the background of health professional regulation and touching on the philosophy of regulation. And we'll finish with a discussion of key concepts and ideas that are often included in professional modern regulatory frameworks. Let's start with the basic question, what is regulation? In the context of our discussion, professional regulation is the framework under which health professions are regulated. It's typically supported by laws that give or limit rights and assign responsibilities to the people that are subject to it. The regulatory model defines the philosophical framework for a professional regulation in a jurisdiction. It lays out the role, the rights and responsibilities of different players, such as government, regulatory agencies like colleges, registered members of the professional agencies, and the public who are subject to the rules. In this setting, regulation is broader than just a reference to the regulations or the rules that organizations are allowed to make under the authority of the laws that govern them. For us, the term regulation also means the entire program used to regulate professions. Now we'll look at some common professional regulation models. These include self-regulation, government regulation, and joint responsibility, which combines both self and government regulation in different ways. Self-regulation is the regulation of a profession by the members of that profession, often with limited decision-making input or participation from the government or the public. There are at least two self-regulation subcategories. There's voluntary. A profession decides to self-regulate its own activities on a voluntary basis. And there's statutory, where a profession carries out self-regulation on the basis of a government rule that establishes the regulatory process. Now, government regulation is the regulation of a profession by government, often with limited decision-making input or participation from the profession or the public. While joint responsibility models of professional regulation imply a degree of partnership in the regulatory process. This partnership is usually between members of the profession and the government, which is often represented by public members. Another distinguishing characteristic between models for professional regulation is whether they are licensure or registration models. Licensure models often provide members of professions with a license to practice. Licenses to practice typically convey the right to practice within an exclusive scope of practice and so essentially limit the capacity of other professionals to offer services within that scope. Such models can limit flexibility in the way that professionals offer the public their services. Registration models provide members of professions with certificates of registration. Like a license, a certificate of registration allows the practice of a profession. However, it generally does not convey the right to practice within an exclusive scope. So, under registration models, health professionals often share aspects of their scope of practice with other health professionals and the practice is seen as a privilege. Since registration models permit professionals to perform activities that are within the scope of practice that is shared or overlaps with other professions, this model can be useful in promoting collaborative care models. Before we move on to RHPA-specific discussions, there are a few important concepts that we should run through first. Public interest. This is the concept that professional regulators should put the interests of the public ahead of the interests of the members of the profession. Conflict of interest. A conflict of interest is a situation where a person has a private or personal interest in a matter, for example an investment or a personal viewpoint, that influences or has the potential to influence their professional judgment in carrying out their official duties in an unbiased way. Potential conflicts can be as troublesome as real conflicts. Bias is related to conflict of interest. It's defined as an inclination or a preference that may have an influence or a potential influence on the judgment a person makes that prevents it from being balanced or even-handed. Any situation where bias may be demonstrated or suspected must be avoided 
to ensure the integrity of regulatory processes and to avoid the challenge as to the impartiality of the adjudicators. Confidentiality. Confidentiality essentially means that information is only accessible to those who are authorized. Confidentiality rules in professional regulation are really important as these rules serve to limit information that can be disclosed and permit disclosure in appropriate circumstances. Having confidentiality rules in place allow a regulatory agency to balance the competing interests of providing information to the public when it's entitled and protecting information that is protected in specific circumstances. Before the Regulated Health Professions Act existed, the legislation governing health professions was a patchwork of statutes and regulations with an inconsistent approach to public protection. This situation was addressed by the striking of the Health Professions Legislative Review in 1982. In 1991, after nearly 10 years, the review issued recommendations for a new model of health regulation in Ontario. The recommendations were the following. The model should be consistent for every profession to be governed by it. The license to practice model should be replaced by a certificate of registration model. Restrictive scopes of practice should be replaced by descriptive scopes of practice that allow for overlap in professional activities. Professions should be required to have programs to improve the quality of the practice of the profession and the relationships between patients and health professions. Protected titles should be given to each profession to aid the public in determining which professions were regulated. And public representation on regulatory colleges should be increased to nearly match the representation from the profession. The most innovative component of the recommendations was that the public should be protected by introducing a completely new idea called the Controlled Acts Model. The Controlled Acts Model would identify the activities that place the public at risk and control who's permitted to perform the activities by authorizing only those with the appropriate training to do them. No jurisdiction had ever before used such a model, so proposing it was a complete paradigm shift in professional regulation. These and other less controversial recommendations formed the basis for the Regulated Health Professions Act, which was passed in late 1991. While the health professions waited for the RHPA to be proclaimed in 1993, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario set up a task force to look into the sexual abuse of patients by health professionals. The task force determined that sexual abuse of patients by health professionals was a significant problem and the task force made suggestions for legislative reform to deal with this issue. Many of these suggestions were used by government to develop a set of sexual abuse prevention amendments to the RHPA that came into law in 1993. Among the most significant of these amendments were a mandatory reporting requirement for health professionals and facilities who become aware during their duties that a professional has sexually abused a patient a zero-tolerance model for actions that are defined as sexual abuse, a mandatory finding of sexual abuse when a health professional has sex with a patient, a mandatory penalty of revocation in circumstances where a health professional is found guilty of sexually abusing a patient, a fund to pay for therapy and counseling of patients when they're sexually abused by health professionals. In late 1993, the RHPA, with these sexual abuse prevention amendments, came into force and 23 health professions began to experience life under the new regime. Since then, additional amendments to the RHP have been made, but none have been as groundbreaking as the original legislation itself. So let's review what we've learned so far. Choose the best answers. Joint responsibility models of professional regulation are based on a regulatory partnership between the public and the profession, used to distribute the cost of professional regulation, a means for the government to abdicate responsibility for professional regulation, or none of the above? The correct answer is the first one. Joint responsibility models of professional regulation are based on a regulatory partnership between the public and the profession. Another question, which answer is best? The Controlled Acts model is intended to identify the healthcare activities that place the public at risk, prevent unqualified people from performing healthcare activities that have an element of risk, restrict the performance of risky healthcare activities to those who have the appropriate training to perform them safely, or all of the above. The answer to this question is the last one, all of the above.